Good morning. I'm Kate Schaefers, and I'm director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's talk, which is part of our 2024 Great Decision Series. Our speaker today is Duncan Cam McCampbell, and our topic is U.S.-China trade rivalry. I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built upon the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the peoples on whose lands we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. So a little bit about our speaker today, Professor Duck Duncan McCampbell is an American lawyer and professor of international business and law at Metropolitan State University in Minneapolis. He spent 14 years, much of it living abroad, with the Westlaw Division of Thomson Reuters, starting new online businesses in the UK, Germany, China, Australia, Hong Kong, and the Netherlands. His professional interests include globalization, international business, non-US legal systems, and corruption prevention. And every year he teaches law and business courses in Chinese universities. He has served as the co-chair of the Minnesota China Business Council, Minnesota's oldest China business organization. He publishes frequently on global commercial, legal, political, and security issues. And he has a new book coming out sometime in 2024, and it's called Sunset Over China. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship between Ramsey County Library, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of Minnesota, Global Minnesota, and the Foreign Policy Association. And we are deeply grateful to these organizations for their support in bringing you these talks to the communities. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Duncan McCampbell. Thank you so much for being here today. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome on this, uh, was this a winter day or a spring day? My Lord, I haven't seen this kind of weather in a long time, but I ha can't complain because I haven't had to do any shoveling, not once. Um, but anyway, uh, it's good to be back, um, and I really applaud the work of um, uh, the Osher Center and Global Minnesota in particular. You know, the Great Decisions Program is put on by the uh, uh, Global Minnesota Organization, and, and all the speakers have been asked to um, bring that, um, that fact to the awareness of the people that benefit from the programming. Um, I've been doing this with Global Minnesota for about uh, six years, and I've always been very impressed with the people that meet and discuss foreign policy issues in the Global um, Minnesota Great Decisions Program. And um, uh, I encourage you to investigate the Global Minnesota to, to support it as an organization that helps Minnesota stay connected to the world um, and in a time when that is very, very important. Um, I'm going to be giving you a presentation, which is kind of a combination of three different uh, presentations I've given on China before, um, with some updating relative to what's going on um, fairly recently. Um, and uh, if you want greater detail on the competition, particularly the strategic competition between the US and China, the U of M's China Center has a webinar series and I gave um, a talk to uh, that uh, to that organization um, in that series back in May. Um, and I'm proud to say that it was the um, biggest um, internet hit among all the webinars they've published at the U of M China Center. And it talks about this um, dilemma that we have in the United States um, dealing with the rise of China and um, how we as Americans could perceive it. I'll be talking about some of the aspects of that, of that discussion in this particular presentation. Um, Global Minnesota has also asked me to reiterate that, that the Great Decisions Program is a nonpartisan uh, foreign policy discussion forum. And um, I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm a human being and I'm an American and I have political views, um, but it is always very important that we do our very best to present this information in, a, in, in a, as objective uh, a, a fashion as possible. 
Um, you may um, find some of the things that I say or that I share to be not in square with, with your point of view on China and the world, and that's fine. That's that's why we have these discussions. But um, I'm, I'm always very careful to try to be as balanced as possible. And nowadays, it's very hard to be balanced about China. I have many uh, friends, they call them China hands, people like me that have worked in China, that understand China, that try to explain China to American audiences, and a lot of people just don't want to hear it. Um, and and that's too bad, because what we have to do um, is learn to uh, understand what's going on in China. It gives better context to some of the things that China and its government does when you understand the internal dynamics. Almost everything that China does externally for example, is a response to internal pressures, which is different from um, the United States and many democracies. Okay, so I'm going to get on the screen share now, and we're going to start this presentation. Um, and and, and I, I've got a lot of content here, and I might not get to all of it. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, the, the, the organizers can make this resource available to people if they want to follow up. And certainly to ask questions, um, I, I'm here to, I'm here to inform, to the best of my ability, the China that I know, so that we can understand this dynamic between the United States and China. Okay. Kate, can you see? Uh, yeah, it looks I'm great. getting that screen across. Good. Okay. I've just I've decided to call this China, U.S. China and Globalization 2.0 because what is happening mostly, you know, between the United States and China is altering the rules of globalization that we have known through our lifetimes. Certainly, um, since the end of World War II, now, I'll be going through sort of the background and how we got to this place and how things are changing. Um, for the past 10 years, it's actually been about 20, the U.S. and China have been locked in a competition. The Chinese were very sort of low-key about the competition for the first sort of 10 years. But since Xi Jinping has become the supreme leader in China, they've become more assertive and less interested in what the world thinks about China and its rise, which is causing some ripple effects in its relations with the world and its best trading partners. No country on earth has benefited more from post-World War II globalization than China. That is a simple fact. China opened, it gave markets for its products to the world, and its growth exploded. But that's because China opened to the world. But when China opened to the world, as I say, it, it allowed in viruses that the Chinese, the Chinese state didn't have the antibodies to control because of their unique political system. And so what China does and is doing now and has done several times throughout its history, it has opened, it has become enriched, but then the external threats, mostly to the internal situation in China, cause the country to close back down again. And it is in the process of doing that right now. Meantime, China is becoming more assertive. And so what do we do with the United States as the world's leading superpower while this phenomenon called China um, streaks across the world stage? And I'm going to share with you my point of view on why the temperature in this conversation needs to be turned down a little bit. Because if you look at Chinese history, it is simply repeating itself again. If you want to know, uh, look, oh, sorry. Uh, if you would like to examine in greater detail the two issues that were provided in the introduction, the Taiwan situation and the new and very odd um, tie up between China and Russia, I have two articles on my uh, blog, um, which I cite here. And it goes into much greater detail about what those, those um, situations really are. 
in a nutshell, um, there is no real viable military option um, for the People's Republic of China to bring Taiwan under its control. Uh, that ship has sailed. Uh, the, the Taiwanese people are not interested in having their government run by Beijing. They've seen what happened in Hong Kong when that one country, two systems fiction um, finally became known as a fiction to the world. Um, and also the the situation in um, with Russia, you know, there are uh, those that are very threatened by the fact that Russia and China are now cooperating. Um, but what happened in Ukraine with Russia's military um, is actually something that the Chinese have followed very closely. And, uh, you know, Putin had it pretty easy. Ukraine is flat. Um, there, there were no appreciable borders. Um, he could roll across the border with his tanks and take take Ukraine. That's what Putin thought he could do, and it didn't happen. And that came as a great surprise to the Chinese. And it's making them rethink all of their military strategies with regard to Taiwan, which, which would be an invasion uh, on an order of 10x in difficulty and risk. Um, in comparison to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Okay, so let's do a little bit of history. Talk about globalization and how we got to where we are today. This is July in 1944. Um, Hitler is surrounded. The, the Russians are driving from the east, the great meat grinder of the Eastern Front. Uh, the Allies have landed in Italy and are driving up the boot of Italy in the south of France. They've landed in Normandy. And the, the jig is going to be up fairly soon for the Third Reich. At the same time, China was occupied by the Japanese. Uh, it was a very brutal occupation that started in Manchuria. And... Um, as you can see from this depiction, the, um, the the shaded areas are where the Japanese were in control. The 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 the, the um, grid areas are where the communists had local influence and control. And as you can see, the entire western part of China was not subjugated by the Japanese, and that's indeed where the nationalist Chinese were um, based in Chongqing and um, in Sichuan. Um, and, and one of the things, of course, the United States was allied with China against Japan in this period. And one of the things that used to frustrate the American generals that were trying to help uh, the Chinese is that the Chinese were often so busy fighting each other that they weren't all um, attacking the common enemy, which was Japan. Um, and we all know what happened um, when um, the war ended uh, with Japan. Um, the occupation of the Japanese soldiers um, went away. They went home. And um, what we got was um, uh, the... Chinese nationalists, the ones that were closest to the United States and received aid from the United States, decamped to Taiwan, which was which had been under Japanese control for quite some time. And they set up a government there, which was every bit as dictatorial and repressive as um, would later emerge on the mainland uh, under the communists. And Taiwan was ruled by Chiang Kai-shek and his family, um, uh, basically as a military dictatorship until the first popular elections were held in the 1990s. So although Taiwan is a vibrant pluralistic democracy today, it wasn't until the 1990s that it actually became that way. And before then, it was a single party autocracy, much like the mainland. So back to our 
situation in July of 44. What we have is a, is a world that is devastated by war. The United States is the only major power that didn't have war going on on its continental territory. Of course, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Um, the Aleutians were attacked by the Japanese. But aside from that, there were no bombs raining down on Detroit and Miami and Los Angeles. Um, and so the United States formed um, this new economic order um, based upon its economic and, and military strength. Bretton Woods was organized in July of 44 when the war was headed in the direction of an Allied victory. So all of these representatives, um, I don't see any women in that group, um, and I'm sure there were some eminent female economists um, at that time, but there you have it. What, these are people who are representing the uh, the, the soon-to-be-victorious powers. The Russians didn't send anyone to Bretton Woods because the Russians were communists and they didn't want to engage in the Western economic system. And throughout the Cold War, the Russians kept themselves in their own sort of economic bubble. How complete was this bubble? When the Soviet Union finally collapsed, it didn't even register on the major indices of the stock exchanges around the world. So unlike today, where China is very integrated into the world economy, Russia was a, a separate sphere, monetary and economic. The Chinese sent representatives to this conference. These were the nationalist Chinese. Now, of course, China was a very poor country uh, before and after the war. They didn't have a lot of influence on the direction of the economic policy. But of course, soon after the war ended in Europe and in and in the Pacific, um, the communists um, took over in 1947 in China, and they had no interest in participating in the Western economic order. So the China and the USSR both opted out of this global order that we call Bretton Woods. Now, what did Bretton Woods create? Well, it created um, an economic system that would rebuild Europe and much of Asia from the war. It was also designed as a counterweight to the Soviet Union, because in those times, the, the United States and its allies knew that the Soviet Union had no interest in participating in a Western-led economic order. It stabilized currency values, and it put the United States basically at the head of an international order um, because of the wealth, the industrial capacity of the United States. It, it was a no-brainer. The institutions that were created were um, the International Monetary Fund, what became later the World Bank, and what became later the World Trade Organization. Because if you're basing your economic system on free trade, you have to have organizations that assure that free trade is going on, free and fair trade. So the mercantilism that led up to World War II, when each country tried to export more than it imported, you know, you can't do that. If everyone's trying to do that, then it's not going to work. So the, the, the whole idea behind the post-war economic system was free, fair, and open trade. No tariffs, no barriers, um, and it largely was successful. Now, meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party is con in control on the mainland, and it was dreadful. Right after the war ended, Mao launched the Great Leap Forward. Now this was, he went to uh, Russia. This was when the Chinese and the Russians were considered themselves brethren in the communist world. And Ma Mao went to Moscow, was very impressed with how the Russians had mobilized state resources to create these big industries. China was an agrarian country with very little industrial capacity. 
And so he tried to jumpstart that with what he called the Great Leap Forward. And it was a it was an initiative of rural industrialization, steel making. He wanted farmers to stop growing crops that fed people and start making steel in their backyards. It was crazy. And the local party authorities were um, given targets um, for production and you know, almost none of the local parties met those production targets, but they fudged the numbers. So Beijing thought things were going in the right direction. Meanwhile, people were starving. The Great Leap Forward was the largest human-caused famine in world history. Uh, there have been famines that have been caused by war, by pestilence, by agricultural failure. This was a government policy that caused the starvation death of 30 million people. Now, when they finally pulled the plug on the Great Leap Forward in the late 50s, Mao had been discredited and sidelined because um, the, 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 the country was traumatized by the Great Leap Forward. But then came the next initiative. Mao had to fight his way back into power with the Cultural Revolution. So he mobilized students, young people, to attack enemies of the state, um, anti-revolutionaries, uh, bourgeois thinkers. Uh, they could be college professors. They could be your parents. They could be anyone. And this is how he clawed his way back into power. And during this time, his word, his little red book became Holy Script. And tens of millions of people were persecuted. And most of the elite suffered enormously. Mao sent um, Xi Jinping's father um, into the country. Xi Jinping uh, grew up in a cave while he was working as a farmer because he was being sent down to the country to be re-educated. So he lived through the excesses of Mao's Cultural Revolution. Another enormous trauma for the Chinese people. Fast forward to 1972 when Nixon made his surprise visit to Beijing to meet with Mao. Mao was ailing. He wouldn't live for much longer. Uh, and what Nixon wanted to do is two things. First of all, he had to get the U.S. out of the Vietnam, Vietnam War, and he needed China's cooperation to do that. Second, he wanted to drive a wedge between China and Russia. This was, this was Kissinger's realist triumph. You know, it wasn't about who's a good country or which country is more aligned with us, with our values. It's about... It's great power competition. And Kissinger saw that the great power competition was between the Soviet Union and the United States. And he wanted to get China peeled away from Russia, which was already in the process of happening. There was actually quite a bit of a split between China and Russia um, in the late 1960s. Fast forward now to 19. 89, the, the year that shook the communist world. Tiananmen Square happened in June of 89, and the Berlin Wall falls in 1989, and the Soviet Union collapses shortly thereafter. That traumatized the Chinese. Entire Chinese think tanks were devoted completely to the issue of what did the Soviets do wrong that allowed their entire empire to collapse. And some of the messages that came out of that, Xi Jinping has, has, has mentioned them several times. But one of the things that the Soviets got wrong, according to the Chinese, is they took their hands off the controls. They let the Russian people start speaking and thinking in terms which weren't dictated by the government things that we take for granted here in the West. But what happened was, was China was in the process of opening up to the world. It happened after Mao died. Mao dies in, in 76. China opens in 78, 79. And they start doing some stuff and they start letting people have some 
thoughts and express themselves. And that's culminated in the Tiananmen Square incident where you remember they had that uh, white lady of liberty that looked a lot like the Statue of Liberty. And what the, what the status quo ruling class of China decided was that things had gotten too open and too out of control, so they clamped down. So they opened up in the late 70s, and then they slammed the door shut to liberalization um, after Tiananmen Square. Well, that didn't last very long because China's economy really stagnated. So along comes Deng Xiaoping at the very end of his career. He was actually the person that mandated the uh, that that ordered the soldiers into Tiananmen Square. He went on what was known as his southern tour. And he realized that in order for China, he looked around Asia and Hong Kong and Taiwan and Japan and South Korea. The Asian tigers were just going great guns. And here was China stuck in the economic doldrums. And he said, look, we've got to open up. We've got to let people make money. We have to let we, we have to let private enterprise thrive. And so China opens up again in 1992 when he went on his famous southern tour. We have to remember the way the Chinese political system worked. Deng Xiaoping did not have an official title. Um he had some minor sort of commission titles, but he was a major political figure behind the scenes. And just by going to these places, Shenzhen in particular, which is just across from Hong Kong, and saying, look, we look look across the border at Hong Kong, and it's just going crazy nuts. Everyone's rich, everyone's happy, pop, you know, and here we are in Shenzhen, and it's a little, you know, impoverished fishing village. We go to Shenzhen now, and it's just, you know, it's 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 a megalopolis. So what he did was, was he used his influence to pry away the Marxist controls that had been put in place after Tiananmen Square. So again, China opens, it closes. It opens, and now we're in another period. Here is how things went in China under these different leaders. Now, Mao impoverished the country, but kept himself in power until he died in 76. There was a bit of an interregnum where they were trying to figure out who the leader is, but Deng Xiaoping became the, the main political figure from 78 to 89. Jiang Zemin, his hand-picked successor, came in, and what he did was he negotiated China's entry into the World Trade Organization, which started the hockey stick of Chinese growth, because all of a sudden now, the things that China made could have access, tariff-free access to the world. And under Hu Jintao, those policies continued, but one of Hu Jintao's major failings was his inability to control the corruption that flourished when China became so rich and prosperous. And now one of the things that Xi Jinping is doing is trying desperately to get that corruption under control. Now, when we look at China's worldview today, we have to remember where the Chinese came from and what they experienced during what they call the century of national humiliation, which started in 1938 when the first opium war, or in 1939, with the first opium war with Britain, where the British, British used a Chinese invention, gunpowder, to attack and subjugate um, Canton, uh, Guangdong, the, the southern uh, Pearl River Delta, and open that up for trade. Well, what they also did was imported opium from India, which ended up addicting one third of the male population of um, Guangdong which is a stain on British history that has never been erased, rightfully. Um, but meantime, the Chinese government, the formerly um, progressive and very strong Qing dynasty was collapsing and losing its power to unify China. So China became a very fragmented and weak country that was preyed upon by the Western powers. 
So after the British pried open China, in comes the French, in come the Russians, in come the Japanese, and decades of military losses and territorial losses. It is an interesting fact that of all these foreign invaders that have vexed China in the 19th and the 20th centuries, there is only one that has failed to return its conquest to China. And that is its current no limits partner, Russia. When China lay on its back defeated and, and bankrupted in the second opium war, the Tsar seized uh, the Amur area, which included the port of Vladivostok, which used to be called by the Chinese Haitian Way, and they haven't returned it. And you don't hear the Chinese talk much about that these days, um, but they want it back. And one of the interesting things that we're, I think is going to happen is as China tries to expand its military presence, its, its naval presence in the Pacific, that is a very well-positioned port for China to do that, and whether the Russians will allow the the Chinese, the superior Chinese Navy to start basing its ships in what was for centuries a Chinese port will be an interesting development indeed. So this is what shapes China's worldview today. There was trauma and shame and exploitation in the prior century. And the opening up made China rich, but it also made China unstable, as it has throughout Chinese history. And so today, what we see in policies by the Chinese government is a drive towards stability and national unity, maintained at almost all cost, at almost every cost. A perfect example is Hong Kong. The Chinese were happy to let Hong Kong sort of plunk along and be sort of salami sliced into control. And then there were the protests of 19, uh, of 2019. I was actually there in China while this was going on. And um, so they had to slap down Hong Kong in a big way. And Hong Kong is suffering enormously uh, politically and economically. But that was considered a price to be paid in order to bring Hong Kong under mainland control. But here's the problem. China's growth model has run out of steam. And you might have read some things about this. Of course, there's the property crisis that's going on. But the growth that freaks out many Western realists was driven by debt and investment, building things, high-speed railways, dams, bridges, all kinds of um, infrastructure that China needed, highways, um, uh, and apartment buildings that nobody needed. And that was all fueled by debt. And that, that economic growth model has run its course. Michael Pettis is one of the world's leading experts on China's economy. And he says, look, there's just no, there's nowhere for them to go. That all the low-hanging fruit of economic growth from building investment has been plucked. And now, in order for China to continue growing in a, in a stable and sustainable way, a consumer economy has to be created. In other words, like the United States, where something is 70% of our economy is driven by consumer spending, China needs that, which is going to be a very painful transition from its infrastructure and debt-driven economic model. And as you can see in the chart on the right, consumer confidence is bad. And this, you know, this is a re result of many things, including the COVID, draconian COVID lockdown policies that they had. People are not spending money in China. And the government desperately needs them to start spending money in order to change their economic model. And of course, their tr major trading partners in the developed economies of the world, the vision, the, the perceptions of China have turned 180 degrees around. Uh, look at the United States. Um, here we have um, almost 
equal positive and negative views right about the time that Xi Jinping took power. And then when he amended the constitution to make him basically leader for as long as he wanted to, wow, things went immediately negative among both political parties. It's one of the few things that political parties in in Washington agree on is that China is not our friend. Look at Australia. Australia used to live, Australia didn't experience the economic crisis of 2007 and 2008. Why? Because they were exporting their commodities, coal, bauxite, iron ore, to feed the Chinese economic and, and um, industrial machine. And look at how perceptions of China have changed in Australia, the UK, Germany. No country is more invested in China than Germany. The big companies, Siemens, BMW, um, BASF, one after another, huge uh, investments in, in production in China. And even the Germans have lost faith in China. So these are China's erstwhile business partners saying, you know what? We don't kind of like the way what we're seeing from China these days. Look at what the Chinese, uh, the foreign ministers of the G7 are saying to China. We want China to abstain from threats, coercion, intimidation, and the use of force. We strongly oppose unilateral attempts to change the status quo by force or coercion. What they're talking about is with Taiwan. Because every time, every time Taiwan does something that displeases Beijing, they shoot some missiles off or they send some planes or some ships to circle Taiwan and, and try to intimidate them. And here is the re redoubtable EU Commission President Ursa von der Leyen um, saying the Chinese Communist Party's clear goal is a systemic change in the international order with China at its center. So when we talk about globalization 2.0, the Chinese don't want to be part of an international order where the United States is at the head of that order. So they want to set up their own order with China at its center. This is their goal. But they've got some problems. Now, you've heard about the birth rate problem. We could, we could spend an hour just talking about how this happened and why it shouldn't have happened. But, you know, demographics are not something that sort of leap out from behind the shrubbery and surprise you. They, they take time to develop, and they generally follow models, which any demographer could demonstrate to you. And the Chinese should have discontinued the one-child-only policy long before they finally did. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because right, you know, about 19 years after one child went into effect, all of a sudden, the factories in Shenzhen and Suzhou didn't have lines of young people from the interior waiting to get jobs assembling our unnecessary plastic objects that we need here so much in the United States. And this was, this was the bottomless pit. If you are an economist, you know about Ricardo and the doctrine of comparative advantage, where each country has a comparative advantage in trade over other countries that they should maximize their advantage to do what they do well and import the things that they don't do well. It's an economic efficiency argument that actually traces back to Adam Smith. Well, what do the Chinese have that give them a comparative economic advantage? over other countries. Do they have natural resources? No, actually. China is one of, is a surprisingly resource, resource poor country when it comes to oil, water, gas, even food. Do they have attractive geography? Well, they've got one coast and it's contested and it's, and they're surrounded by people that are not necessarily very friendly to them. China's comparative economic advantage is a huge, low-paid, hardworking 
unentitled workforce. And that workforce is going away. Meanwhile, people are living a lot longer. So not only are fewer children being born, but the people that are alive are staying alive a lot longer. That is a huge drag on the government's pension responsibilities and healthcare responsibilities. And for those of you that track such things, the female par workforce participation in China has been declining precipitously in recent years. Now, when I go to China, and I teach, often my best students are female students. And sometimes the, the, the fellows I have to go into the video, they have these video arcades where they sit there and smoke cigarettes and drink Red Bull and play these video games all day. And I have to drag them out by their ear and tell them to go outside. It's a beautiful sunny day and there's pretty girls out there. Um, that's another issue entirely. Um, but these females that I that I teach in China, um, their job prospects are not very attractive. Why? Well, first of all, they don't have employment laws which prohibit discrimination based on gender. And an employer in China doesn't generally want to hire someone who's going to work for a year or two and then start making a family and taking parental leave. And so they've got a double whammy. The government wants Chinese women to have more children. Um, it's becoming economically impossible for Chinese families to have more than one child. Um, and so a lot of Chinese uh, females today are just opting out of the entire cultural expectation of marriage um, while young, um, forming a family, staying at home, um, while the husband goes out and, and does whatever he does to support the family. That, that entire structure is being challenged at this very minute. Now, while the Chinese have gotten all sort of uppity and assertive, they've actually done some incredible things when it comes to building alliances. You see the quad in the upper right-hand corner. That's Kushida of Japan. That's Modi of, of India. That's our President Biden and the new uh, Australian uh, uh, Prime Minister Albanese. And um, they're getting together and saying, you know what, we need to, we're not going to call this an alliance, but we're going to support each other because we have a common threat. It's called China. Then there's the AUK US, which is an initiative to share US nuclear submarine technology. The only country that we've ever shared that technology with in the past has been the UK. Um, but now we're going to get um, Australia in on it, and it looks like New Zealand wants to join that club. Upper right-hand corner, this is actually quite remarkable. You might have recalled the, the, uh, the president of the Philippines, who was term-limited out of offices, Duterte, who had some very unkind things to say about the United States, went into China and got all cozy with Xi Jinping. Meanwhile, the Chinese Navy and the Coast Guard continued to harass Philippine Coast Guard or um, uh, fishermen in and around the waters of the Philippines. Well, the new Philippine president, Ferdinand Marcos III, said, you know what? I'm going to reestablish ties with the United States. And that's the, uh, and he's shaking hands there with the um, U.S. Um, Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. And now there are basing agreements where the U.S. can base forces um, throughout the Philippines. They are going to be converting the Subic Bay Naval Base um, uh, into what was the Subic Bay, Subic Bay Naval Base into a forward maintenance and repair facility for the U.S. Navy. It's a big deal. The two bottom ones are particularly remarkable. If you know anything about the fraught relationships between Japan and North Korea, going back to the World War II and the dreadful behavior of the Japanese on the Korean Peninsula, that wound has never been healed. But China's behavior and North Korea's behavior has forced these two very important American allies to start talking to each other. And they are, and they're working together. So that is Kishida and the new president of, of, of um, South Korea, 
meeting together in Tokyo and mending fences and healing old wounds. And finally, I was in uh, Vietnam for a conference um, a couple of months ago. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely remarkable the change in Vietnam's stance. Now, this is a country that was devastated by war with the United States. Um, and it's run by a, a communist dictatorship in, in much in the same way as China has. But you see the president holding his hand to his uh, chest. They played the U.S. national anthem for President Biden when he visited um, Hanoi, which is an, an absolutely remarkable event. Now, are, is Vietnam in the U.S. camp militarily as an ally? No, but you might know that uh, Vietnam has had a very difficult relationship with its powerful neighbor, China, to the north. And Vietnam and China fought a war in 1979. In fact, that was the last time that China was engaged in a military confrontation of any of any scale. And the Vietnamese gave the Chinese a black eye in that contest. Now, you, you could say that um, many reasons for that, but of course the Vietnamese military had sort of um, honed its skills by fighting a great um, foreign uh, uh, enemy, the United States. But um, the Vietnamese are, are being very careful because they don't want to alienate China. They do a lot of trade with China, but they also have decided that it's important for them to get along with the United States. And that is happening right now. And finally, the presidential poll, which just happened in Taiwan, the, 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 the Beijing, the, they, they've got one, one tool in their box and it's called a hammer. So anytime they get mad, it's something that Taiwan does, especially you know when Nancy Pelosi landed in, in Taipei, they just went ballistic. Well, all and then they, you know, they do a bunch of threatening stuff with airplanes and ships and missiles. Well, all that is done is make sure that the DPP, this is the party least interested in cooperating with China, is reelected. So the vice president under the president. Um, the, the previous president, who was term limited out of offices, out of office, was elected in the Taiwan election, and the opposition was fragmented. But all of the parties running for election in in Taiwan for the first time have said, "We are not interested in unification with China." Now, some want to be more cooperative and less confrontational with China. That's fine. But for the first time, no major political party in Taiwan. It has a platform like the KMT used to have, where they are interested in more closer political and economic unity with, with the mainland. It's a major change. So what we have now is a situation where China has fraught relations with all of its trading partners. It has a demographic decline. It has um, been surrounded um, uh, on three sides by um, allies and friends of the United States. And you know what? Xi Jinping got called on the carpet by the party elders at their annual summer retreat in Beatty High. Now, this is not something that is reported in the press. This is all leaked. Um, it's a very secretive conclave of the current Chinese leadership and the old guard. These are the, they, they invite the, retired politicians and officials to come and he got he got a grilling from those the the old sweats of the Chinese Communist Party so, and here's what they saw China is ringed now be, because of its bellicose and um, assertive behavior all of these countries have started to move into the US orbit of course Japan was already there the uh, South Koreans, the previous president was more accommodative to China. That has changed. So we have Japan and South Korea in the north. Of course, we have the um, Taiwan um, anchoring the first island chain and the string of islands between Taiwan and Japan, which Okinawa is, is the largest of them. And it's a major forward um, military base for the United States Marines, the United States Air Force. The biggest change was the Philippines moving back into the U.S. sphere, anchoring the south. 
of the first island chain. And I have circled Vietnam as being friendly with the United States. Thailand is the only Southeast Asian nation that has a defense treaty with the United States. And they remain friendly, although they're getting friendlier with the Chinese lately, which is somewhat worrisome. And then, of course, there's India. India, off to the left, has had some very difficult um, problems with China, particularly on its border disputes. And then there is little tiny Singapore, which actually has a basing agreement with the United States Navy, and it buys its military equipment from the U.S. Um, um, it is neutral. It is not an ally of the United States, but it is friendly to the U.S. And then, of course, there is Australia, which is off the map, and they are a major um, a pillar of American military and economic influence in, in Asia. When we're talking about India, India is a little bit freaked out because they are, they are surrounded by Chinese uh, countries which are aligned with China. Myanmar that has a brutal dictatorship, is supported by China. China has a, an oil and gas pipeline that passes through Myanmar to the Bay of Bengal, which, which helps them get around their, their Malacca Strait issue. Um, uh, the, the whole um, situation up in the Kashmir continues to be a problem between India, Pakistan, and China. Pakistan is, is teetering on the edge of being a failed state, but it is a donor. Or it, is, it, it, it receives uh, massive economic aid from China. And China is building uh, a, a port facility um, on the Arabian Sea to give it access to um, through the Ladakh um, uh, corridor to the Arabian Sea. And of course, Sri Lanka, again, another state which is teetering on the edge of insolvency. But the Chinese built a port facility in the south of the island. The Sri Lankans could not uh, service the debt on that. So the Chinese said, okay, well, fine, we'll forgive the debt, but we will take a 99 year lease on that. So it won't be long until Chinese naval ships start basing and provisioning in Sri Lanka, which won't make the Indians very happy. And of course, all of the stuff that goes along on along the border between China and India is causing enormous difficulties between those two countries. Okay, I'm going to stop here for a moment and sort of reset. So what I've kind of shared with you is um, the situation that China finds itself in. And, and now what we're going to do is take a look at how Americans choose to perceive China and its rise. And there are different schools of thought on that. There are what I call the collapse school of thought, which look at China's enormous debt problems um and it's it's fraught relations with much of its trading partners um the collapse of its property sector and other and and its demographic challenge and they say you know what china's going to collapse and i don't agree with that china is a survival machine um china is going to go through a period of adjustment and we have to be very careful that they don't become so unstable that they do unpredictable things and then there's the uh the war scenario there is a certain uh group of individuals in the american foreign policy and defense establishment that believe that china is bent on taking over the world with its large military and that we should all start teaching our children chinese because pretty soon they're going to be in charge of everything and i don't agree with that either and i'm going to go through a couple of um uh, a few slides here to demonstrate to you why both of those points of view are are incorrect. But we have to remember that we, as Americans, think, process our information in a certain way. We are culturally descended from the ancient Greek civilization. Now, this is a book that I suggest that everyone read. It's the Geography of Thought. I actually use a translation of that when I teach law in China so that my Chinese law students can understand how Americans think. This helps us understand how Chinese think. And this book by Nisbet says, you know, we are descended from the Greeks. 
And what do the Greeks like? Well, they like to contest. You know, you look at those urns, they're, you know, people running and throwing spears. And the, the Chinese were about, or the, 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 the ancient Greeks were all about expression, maximizing all of your potential, agency, personal agency. You are in charge of your future. It sounds very American, and it is. And so what comes out of that cultural heritage is what we as Americans value. Freedom of individual action, liberty, a desire for individual distinctiveness. We believe in universal rights. We think what's right for me is should be right for you, and it should be self-evident. And that we believe that rules governing proper behavior should be universal. There isn't any particularism involved. Well, the Chinese think differently. They like to blend harmoniously with a group. They accept hierarchy. They value harmony over liberty and distinctiveness. And we don't think that way. But when we think in our Greek way and we look at China, where do we go? Well, this is how we process our China problem. The Greeks gave us our binary win-lose method of addressing contradictions. So we have elections, someone wins, someone loses. We have lawsuits, someone wins, someone loses. These are binary contests. You put them in the ring, they grapple, they fight, and out comes a winner. That is how we are programmed to resolve conflicts. So we say to ourselves, look at China, they're getting big and powerful. Who's going to win? This is how we think. And then we think like 19th, 18th century Europeans. What do countries do when they acquire a big navy like China has? Well, what they do is they behave like 18th and 17th century Europeans. They go to foreign places, they kill a bunch of people, steal their stuff, and take it home. Right? That's 18th century colonialism. And there's an assumption that because China has the world's largest navy, they're going to use that to subjugate foreign people and, and impose their will upon other folks. And, you know, there's a problem with that because the Chinese once did have the world's most powerful military, most powerful navy and their largest ships. Why didn't they cross the Pacific and colonize the United States with those ships? They invented the compass. Those ships were centuries ahead of what was being built um, by the Greeks, the Romans, the Phoenicians, the, the Portuguese. Why didn't they do that? And we think like Americans, we think, go golly, look at that growth curve of Chinese growth, you know, that hockey stick. And they just assume, because we're Americans, we are glass half full people, we believe in trends, that that trend is going to continue. So these are the three ways that we process our China problem. We like to resolve disputes by contest, who's going to win, who's going to lose. We believe that countries which we become militarily powerful will use that to subjugate other people and cross vast oceans and take and steal things from people. Or um, and we believe in trends. So there is a there is a a, a series of books that discuss this, the two genres. The ones on the left are the most popular books um, on the, you know, China is going to take over the world. And the ones on the right are the ones that say um, uh, China is about to collapse. Um, Gordon Chang's book has um, so far proven to be not very prophetic. And now he's saying that China isn't going to collapse, but they're still going to try to take over the world. And then there is another group which talks about the China's many challenges. I I I particularly recommend reading these books. In in, in fact, in Invisible China, and it talks about how China, um, the future of China, is going to be shaped by its rural people because that's the only place that babies are being made in China, is in the interior of China, the, the rural, where the schools are not good, the healthcare is not good, 
um, the, even the, the, the food supply is not good, but that's China's future. And I'm going to particularly call out this book. This book was a national bestseller. And it basically said that the China contest between the US, um, the US and China today is just like this contest between Sparta and Athens in the Peloponnesian War, 431 BC. Okay, and that's a bit of a stretch, but it, basically it went like this. Um, Sparta was the established power. Sparta was the U.S. analog. And Athens was the upstart. They were the uppity ones. They want to take on Sparta. And they say that, and he says, that isn't the only one. There are a, a series of other contests throughout um, 19th century, 17th and 19th century European history, Portugal and Spain, France and the Habsburg Empire, where an upstart takes on the established power. And the central theme is that whenever that upstart challenges an established power, war follows. So he said China is challenging American power and authority throughout the world. And you know what? We're destined for war. What he gets so wrong is this. In each of these rising power scenarios, going back to Sparta and Athens, the upstart power was an established military power. Now, China has the world's largest navy. You have to go back to the Vietnam War, well, actually the war with Vietnam in 1979, to find any place where the Jap or the Chinese Navy actually fired a weapon in anger. You have to go back even further. Uh, the, Jap the, the Chinese did not have an appreciable Navy during the Korean War. So you can say that China is a military power on paper because it's got a lot of ships. It's got some real scary looking missiles. It has a big land army. But it is not an established military power. It has not fought and won a single war in the 20th century. Let me repeat that. China has not fought and won a single war in the 20th or the 21st century. But Athens was an established military power. They kicked Persia out of the Eastern Mediterranean. And the best admirals and and generals of the time happened to be Athenian. There's no such there's no such figure of military prominence in China. So China has no war fighting experience. Not a single living officer in China's enormous military has commanded a combat formation in a real modern war. This chap was made a torchbearer at the Beijing Olympics. Why? Because he is the colonel, the local commander that commanded the Chinese forces that killed about 20 Indian soldiers up on the frozen mountaintop in the Himalayas a couple of years ago. Did you know that they fought with stones and clubs because the commanders took the guns and knives away from them because these guys were always meeting up and scuffling with each other and they didn't want anyone killed so those indian soldiers were killed with a blunt force blow to the head the rock or a club this guy was a national hero he is their guderian their macarthur their gya think about that then there's pillsbury's hundred year war and it's he looks at the hockey stick of growth and says, you know what? They're going to take over the world. Look at that growth. That's going to continue. Well, it's not going to continue. He says that China is the distance runner. They've got a long-term plan, secret plan to take over the world. And it's a very American belief in the continuation of trends. But what he gets so wrong is that China is not a marathon runner. It is the opposite. China is the strongest, fastest, rule-breaking, steroid-juiced, unsustainable 
sprinter that the world has ever seen. And the Chinese even know that. Their premier said in, famously, its economic trajectory is unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, and unsustainable. And it is proving that way right now. Okay, I won't get into why China isn't going to collapse, but the biggest issue is, is we're using Western metrics to look at China's problems and saying, well, look at that. Well, their banking system is nothing like ours. So there's the banking, the, the, the major policy banks in China are all owned by the government. The, the government is not going to allow these Chinese banks, banks to collapse the way we allowed Lehman Brothers to collapse. So that, that's just not going to happen. And the whole property crisis is being mitigated by a, a party which has bottomless amount of funds to bail themselves out of economic problems in ways that would never be contemplated in a Western economy. Now, the housing problem that they're having now is has wiped billions, trillions of dollars off of property values and stock portfolios around the world. And it would have driven any Western-based economy into a recession. Then they're and they're defaulting on on onshore and offshore bonds. And why isn't China collapsing? Because the government is a survival machine. The Communist Party of China was built to survive these difficulties. So when we use Western metrics, Western democratic metrics, um, we, we fail at analyzing China's problems. And this is the essence of my new book, which will be coming out later this year, about why China <clears throat> is not going to take over the world, is not going to collapse, and is, um, is going to enter a long period of very low growth and painful adjustments to its growth model. Now, I am looking here at the Q&A, um, and an anonymous attendee has asked, how is China viewed by Russia? Well, that's interesting, because they both have very interesting perceptions about each other. Um, first of all, the Chinese, um, um, the Chinese view Russia as a has-been and as incompetent. Um, and they look at what um, Putin did in, in, um, in Ukraine, you know, Putin and Xi met at the Beijing Olympics just before the um, the Russians invaded Ukraine. And they certainly had a discussion because, of course, the Russian arms were piled up on the Ukrainian border. Everyone was saying, oh, Vladimir, what are you going to do? And he said, oh, I'm not going to invade. And of course he did. Well, what he probably told Xi was what um, he probably believed was that He's going to go in there, punch through the lines, uh, get to Kiev, kick out um, the leadership, install someone that's friendly to Moscow, and you know, and move on. Well, that didn't happen, and it actually caused big problems for China because, of course, the EU, which was very threatened by Russia's actions on its own doorstep, is China's largest trading partner. And the Europeans want China to tell Russia to back off. And of course, it's not going to do that. How is China viewed by Russia? Well, Russia believes China is, is a bit uppity. And, um, but, uh, China, but Russia knows that China has things that it, that it needs. It needs money. Um, China needs Russian oil. Um, and China needs Russian military technology, for example, jet engines, which China has been singularly un, un, unable to develop itself. Um, another question is, what is the situation with the Chinese billionaires like Jack Ma, some of whom seem to have disappeared? Well, when Jack Ma was called on the carpet um, and his um, and his country and his company, Alibaba, suffered enormous losses in stock markets, it's because Jack Ma had gotten a bit uppity. He went to a conference somewhere in Europe and criticized the, the stodgy bankers in China. And um, he basically got out ahead of himself. And what 
Xi Jinping did was he did now Jack Ma, you have to understand, Jack Ma is more than the Warren Buffett of China. He is a national hero. He is he is seen he was the richest man in China. He's seen as a, a as a massive success story. Um but it would be kind of like uh, Warren Buffett saying something critical of the U.S. government and then having his entire empire destroyed. And that's what happened um, to uh, Jack Ma. And it has happened to not just to Jack Ma, but all of these people that think that they that gotten so rich and powerful that they don't believe that they need to follow the party line. Xi Jinping is asserting authority over every power center in China. Lately, it's the military. But he's already whacked down a lot of these um, oligarchs. Thoughts on China's interest in Africa? China wants uh, the resources in Africa. They're willing to build all kinds of stuff for the African countries and help the um, uh, the democratic and non-democratic regimes in uh, Africa stay in power. Um, uh, but they're also doing this on a loan basis. And many countries like Kenya um, have entered into um, uh, agreements with China that they cannot sustain economically. And that's going to be a problem. It's called debt, debt trap diplomacy. But basically, um, the Chinese have found that their money gets them UN votes and resources in Africa. You mentioned the babies are only being born in rural China, but I thought virtually young adults of childbearing age have left for cities to find work. So here's the situation. Um, Chinese babies are being born all over China, but the birth rates in rural China are much higher than they are in the cities. Now, what happens is, let's say you are uh, one of my students in a third tier Chinese city. And uh, you graduate with a degree in uh, business or law, um, you're not going to get a decent job in your village or the town that you come from. You have to go to the provincial capital. Or even better yet, you go to Guangzhou or to Shanghai or to Beijing. And so what happens is, is these people get married, but one of the, uh, the you know, one of the people or both of them go to get a high paying job in the big cities and they leave their child with their parents back in the village. You have an entire generation of young Chinese um, that are being raised by their grandparents. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not optimal. So um, it, there's a disruption in the nuclear family situation in China. Uh, what does a balanced relationship look like with China? Well, it uh, we talk about. I talk about this at the end. Um, of course, we have to be very clear-eyed about how China um, has finally um, made it very clear to everyone that they believe that our system is antithetical to theirs. So we have to protect our values, our system, our property. We have to find ways that we can interact with China in ways that do not degrade those valuable assets. Um and 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 we can interact with China. We can we can trade with China, um, but uh, we 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 cannot allow China to benefit from advance advancements in Western technology in the way that they have for the first forty years of their opening. If suburban Chinese <clears throat> women are not joining the workforce or having children, what are they doing? Well, they're lay. It's called laying flat. And there's an entire movement within the Chinese youth culture where they, it is such an incredibly competitive environment that, um, you know, from the day they're born, it's they're, they're being grilled. Um, you know, there was a, um, the Chinese government decided that there were too many kids, um, too much um, household wealth was being paid, a uh, 20% in the cities to, um, send kids to private tutoring um, services. So they'd come home from school, the kids, they'd have dinner and off they go to the, the tutoring services. And it's because the Chinese want to give their kids, their one child often, the every opportunity to, to succeed in a, in a hyper competitive environment. 
Well, so this money was going to these private um, companies that were doing, you know, language tutoring and math tutoring. And and the Chinese government didn't want, and these companies were private and they were, you know, listed on the New York Stock Exchange, like New China was the big one. I have, I have friends that work work at that company. And they didn't want uh, this, these private companies um, basically uh, benefiting from this, this, this desire from Chinese parents to give their kids a leg up. So they banned private tutoring. Well, you know, what ended up happening is that the, is the families that have the money can have one-on-one -on -one private tutoring, you know, and not send them to these schools. And so what it did, it, all it did was increase the inequality between moderate income Chinese people and higher income Chinese people. Economic globalization has resulted in the U.S. giving away technology and manufacturing. What is the future of this turning around? Well, the Chinese had, um, you know, that many companies um, knew that the Chinese were stealing their stuff. And in fact, the U.S. Commerce Department went to some of these companies. There was an NPR um, um, study on this um, about, it's about six years old now, where they went to these American companies and say, hey, you know, look here, we've got this evidence that the Chinese are ripping off your stuff. You know, what do you want us to do? And they said, don't do anything. Because they knew that if the U.S. government whacked the Chinese for stealing in U.S. intellectual property, the Chinese would re retaliate by kicking those co companies out of the country. So what many of these companies did is they adopted a strategy of staying one step ahead technologically, knowing that the Chinese were going to rip off their technology, but making sure that the Chinese don't get access to the leading edge. A perfect example of this is the the manufacturers of jet engines, or GE, Pratt & Whitney. The Chinese have never been able to make their own jet engines. So even though they've made a new um, single-aisle jetliner, the avionics are all Western. The engines are all Western. And it's all down to how um, the, uh, the, the processes and the metallurgy that goes into machining turbine blades and those companies like Rolls-Royce, GE, and Pratt & Whitney have been very good at protecting their intellectual property from the Chinese. And it bothers the Chinese that they have the world's second largest commercial jet fleet. And every aircraft that is in that fleet is made by either Boeing or Airbus. And the engines are the most expensive part, and they're made by foreign com companies. Economic globalization has resulted in the U.S. giving away technology. So, um, uh, giving away technology—it's been—it's been, it's been a, um, um, a, pro a process that um, has gotten a lot of com um, companies to open their eyes. The Germans um, are the perfect example. The the Germans are the world leaders in precision manufacturing, and the Chinese are very attracted to that. And um, the Germans, um, you know, BMW, Volkswagen, Mercedes, Porsche, they are all they all make things in China. And the Chinese have learned how to make cars from the Germans. Well, now what the Chinese are doing is they're building electric vehicles and they have excess capacity because the government has said this is their priority. So everyone's piling into electric vehicles. There's like 200 electric vehicle companies in China right now. And what do they do with this XX capacity? Well, they export it, and they're going to export it to Europe, and the Europeans are freaked out because there's no way that the, the Europeans can, can compete with electric vehicles that are made in China, um, subsidized by the Chinese government. And, they're, and, 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 and the Germans are finally waking up to the fact that the Chinese have stolen their watch to tell them what time it is, in essence. Okay, I have come to the end of the questions, and um, we have a chat here. Um, oh, okay. So, uh, Kate, so Kate actually, how much time do I have? Yeah, we have about another 10 minutes, but I do have a follow-up question. Um, so, you know, you mentioned about child care and uh, children being raised in the countryside with their grandparents. Um, with their aging population, what infrastructure is in place in China for dealing with aging, their aging population and elder care. And, you know, how how is China approaching the needs of an aging population? Well, I have, um, I believe, a fascinating anecdote to share with you about that. 
about four years ago, I was contacted by a Chinese colleague that said that they're sending in a delegation of Chinese business people to the United States to learn about elder care. Now, you see, in China, it is it is it is dishonorable to to offload your elder care responsibilities to a third party. You don't send granny off to a nursing home. You care for them. They they are part of your nuclear family. They stay in your home until the very end of life, basically the hospice stage. And um, but because of the one child only policy, sometimes one couple is caring for two sets of parents. And sometimes those couples are not living in the same village or town or small city as they were raised. And so there is this enormous need in China to look after, um, to have, to pay someone to look after their parents. <clears throat> now, the Chinese were very interested in the model. I took them around Presbyterian homes, um, Episcopal homes, ecumen. So it covered all the sort of faith-based options. And, and here was one of the interesting takeaways. The Chinese were interested in, in, in basically licensing the brand of, of press homes. And, um, and it wasn't because they are a Christian organization. What they wanted was the perception that the parents were being cared for by a Christian organization. But they wanted the cross and the symbolism on the branding because there is a person when i was living in beijing um i would go out for my sunday morning runs when the pollution wasn't too bad and i ran right past a christian church in central beijing it's a catholic church and i would often find um horribly mutilated and um and, and injured uh, beggars um in the churchyard of that church and you wouldn't see them anywhere else in Beijing. And I asked a Chinese colleague why that was. And they said, well, it's because the Chinese believe that Christians are kind and generous people. And this carries forward to this notion that if you have to endure the shame of, off, of, of offloading the care of your parents to a third party, at least send them to a place where, where the reputation is good and that they are being cared for and the best one possible would be a christian organization it's very interesting cultural point of view and so the there's a growth industry a huge growth industry to answer your question of elder care in in china and how did those organizations respond to you know well i think i don't know if it went anywhere um uh, you know, they Press Homes was not going to license their brand um, without having the essence of their um, management philosophy follow with that brand. Um, you know, but I just I was just very I was very struck by the, the the these business people having this business belief that that Western branding would be the optimal way Western faith-based branding would be the optimal way to launch these um, these senior centers in China. Yeah, it does sound like a big cultural challenge for them and just, you know, how to yes. express yes. a growing issue. Yes, yes. And these people are living longer. You know, they, they retire earlier. One of the things that has to change is, <clears throat> you know, women retire in China at the age of 55, and I think men um, have to wait till like 59 or 60. <clears throat> but you know that th those 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 dates were set when people didn't live as long in China, and now so th one of the things that the Chinese government has to do is is extend the retirement date. Well, you saw what happened when they tried to do that in France; they didn't they didn't do it very well, um, or they didn't propose it very well. But it it will cause enormous disruption when, um. You know, th these people are living 30 years beyond their retirement and, you know, living off of pensions. There isn't a, a, a private wealth management industry in China. So, you know, you don't invest in a 401k. Um, you the main way people um, save money for their retirement is to buy property. They buy apartments. They don't necessarily occupy them. They could sit empty. 
there isn't a huge rental market in China. You don't just rent it out to someone. They don't pay property taxes on it. There's no property tax. So they buy, if they have some extra money or they have some extra credit, they they buy an apartment knowing or thinking that the price, the value is always going to go up. Well, recently, the value has stopped going up. And so the, the life savings of millions of Chinese have been affected by the property downturn. This is why people are sitting, you know, they're not spending money. They were spending money when the, their savings, i.e. their property holdings, were increasing in value year, year in and year out. But that hasn't happened. So the, 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 a, 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 an appreciable consumer economy will not occur in China until the bottom has finally been reached in the property crisis, where, where people can own property and, 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 and also it, it won't happen until until an appreciable wealth management industry has occurred. And let me just make this one last point. Mm -hmm. The Chinese government wants people to take their money and put it in banks. These are Chinese owned policy banks. These are owned by the government and they're not paid much in interest for putting their money in these banks. Why? The Chinese government takes that money and invests it in the things that it wants. So it has this <clears throat> bottomless supply of cheap cash to invest as it sees fit. So it doesn't want to have an Edward Jones or a, a you know, a, a, a brokerage or these private entities managing your wealth and 401ks and all the other things that we have to, to, you know, privately develop our growth because the Chinese government wants to keep that money in, in circulation, in government controlled organizations and institutions. So that's why you don't have that that whole constellation of investment options. And the and this Chinese stock market is little more than a casino because you don't know what you're investing in. So the only surefire investment that Chinese people had when they had a few extra shekels is they'd go out and buy an apartment, knowing that the value would increase. And that and that's over. That's done. Now so um I was going to say, I, have, the end. Um, I don't know, a, a quick question. What does laying flat mean for young women? What does what? Laying flat. You said young women are just laying flat. Um, it's um, the, the, that's the, uh, the, that's the, um, that's the imperfect uh, translation. Um, it is, um, it, the young people have opted out of the rat race. And so, they are learning to live without needing to spend much money and they're not chasing fashion and they're not chasing brand and they're not chasing career. They are basically checking out of the entire system and that's what they call lying flat. And it's not just women. It's the, the, the pressure is even more severe on young men. We see some parallels here as well when we talk about quiet quitting or, you know, just people making different decisions, our younger people. Yeah, it freaks out the Chinese government because they need they need young people to be working hard and to strive and to grow and to continue to, you know, feed the economy. Yes. Um, um, so, I don't know if we have time for any more questions. We're right at the end here and there's a couple of good questions. I'm sorry we haven't reached all of them, but I just want to say, Dr. McCampbell, this has been a terrific, informative presentation. I also want to thank Grayson, who's been providing our um, background support through this whole presentation. And our next Great Decisions Lecture is on Friday, February 9th. The topic is Understanding Indonesia, and our speaker is Rick Olson. So thank you so much for being here today, and uh, you can visit our um, Ali YouTube station to see a recording of this, as well as Ramsey County's, um, Ram Ramsey County's website. So thank you so much for being here, and um, have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you.